Okay, it's free if you like. Well, good evening to everybody here this evening, and also those who are going to be watching uh, later in the week this video on the beginning of our Christian theology tour and journey together. This is the beginning of a long journey, and, uh, but a long journey begins just by taking a step. And for a long time, I have wanted to take a step in this direction, into giving some time to look at the content of what we believe as Christians. Not just in one or two evenings, but to do it over one or two years, slowly, and uh, paying attention to the important truths of our faith. It's going to, it is called the Christian Doctrine Course, so it's a whole course. For those of you who are on the WhatsApp group, I sent the course outline uh, on WhatsApp. If you haven't got that and you uh, would like to participate, you are going to be participating, just speak to myself or email myself or to Heather, that we can include you on that. And I encourage you to print that out, to take that course outline. As you can see, it's sort of an analytical outline. And that is, that is going to give you the skeletons of all the different topics and subjects that we're going to be looking at over the next two years or so. Um, and that might change as we go along, because you know you don't learn how to swim by staying on the seashore. You learn to swim by getting in the ocean. Uh, in any subject, there's this whole thing between theory and practice. And as we practice and go through this course, uh, and we have interaction and feedback and how things are going, then it's something that I can improve upon. Uh, and for the rest of the course and for next time that we do that. But for me, it is really uh, something that I feel with a divine necessity and a divine compulsion to to do this, because uh, for, I have taught, some of you know, I've taught theology at a seminary, and uh, so I've got quite a lot of resources, I've, I've been through courses with students, and there are things that I think are important for every Christian to be cognizant of and to know and to study and to learn, not just people who are preparing for the ministry. But also because of the times we're living in, the critical times that we're living in, uh, I don't, it, it is to a certain degree unprecedented, as always, you could say, the times we're living in. But particularly with our exposure to so many ideas and so many opinions uh, that you and the church and your children and people are getting exposed to, the need to know what is due north, the need to know what's the direction we need to be walking in, the need to know the truth. I think is as critical as ever, but certainly ex I experience it as more urgent as something that we need to know today. So um, this is this is some of the reason for that. So have a look at that, the website that's got the outline on that. Um, as we go through this particular course, um, the frequency, the time, a lot of that we will uh, feel our way forward as we do that. As I've said to you before, I'm not in a rush to do this. Even if you can't make it here, God willing, we'll, we'll, we'll be recording these things so you can follow the sequence because it's going to be very orderly and very sequential as we go through the different topics of uh, theology. So if you miss one or you can't get here, you know you can go home. Uh, or, or you can at home then just look at what you have missed so that you can keep, keep uh, up to date with everything that we're going to be doing. Um, let me give you a little bit of, a, uh, of an objective for this course and also a dedication. And some of these things I wrote about eight years ago, particularly the dedication. Um, which one or two of you might know the person that I would like to remember. Um, and let me say also at the outset of this, the next three, two or three lectures or talks that I'm going to be doing are going to be preparatory and preliminaries. So we're not going to get straight into this even to the doctrine of God. We're going to do a little bit of some preliminaries about that. So that's going to take a bit of time, 
but that's not bad, it's a good thing to do. Um, so I'm going to go through things quite logically and explain as we go along. And I'm also going to get my rhythm to talking with you and communicating the information that I've, that I've got on my notes here. Uh, because I've got some really beneficial things to talk about, but I don't want this to just to be reading something to you and to get the mix between those two things. Sometimes I'll just read it, uh, and I'm going to make all these notes available and put them, everything I'm going to be saying, you don't have to, if you want to, and sometimes it's good to just write something down that was particularly highlighted for you or particularly important for you, but in terms of the content of this, it's all going to be recorded, and God willing, when we've finish that, we can actually, I can actually put something together and have that available for, for anybody else. So there might be a, a few teething problems in just as we get into the dynamics of the notes and the whiteboard and things of that nature, but bear with me as we go along. Uh, let's open in prayer and ask God's Spirit to bless these times together. Father, God of all truth and all grace, who has given us the Holy Word. And as for some of us heard as the King Charles was presented with the Bible as the book that is the greatest gift that any man can give to one another, that this world can afford no greater gift than the Scriptures. We thank you that this is the royal law, and these are the lively oracles of God. And it's for the sake of knowing your word and knowing you that we are going to venture now into the whole field of Christian theology and doctrine. Father, this is to know you, to listen to you, to understand you, so that we can speak more faithfully your truth into our lives and into our world today. We ask in everything that has been prepared and in the presence of with one another, that your Spirit would seal these truths and the things that are from you into hearts and minds. Please bless our gathering and our time together, and may there be that work of the Spirit of truth amongst us, that no man can take the glory or the praise at the end of the day. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. So what is the objective of the, this course in Christian theology? <coughs> well, my objective is to provide an orderly course of instruction in Christian teaching for every Christian about the important doctrines of our faith. And I hopefully, as we go through this, will produce for you a helpful and a needed manual <coughs> of Christian instruction that will give you the, a summary of important Christian doctrine of, and, and exposition of the things that are important for our faith and how to apply some of those things to the questions we ask and to the issues that we're facing in our world today. I'm doing what has traditionally be call, been called catechesis. Some of you might have gone to catechism. I remember I had a Catholic friend and I always felt terribly sorry for him when on a Friday we were going on with our bikes and having fun and enjoying ourselves. Oh, he had to go to catechism. And I thought it was such a, such a sad thing to have to go and do on a Friday afternoon. And he was a Catholic and preparing for uh, reception, I think, into the Catholic Church. But I think it's an important word that we need to resurrect and we need to uh, um, bring into our Christian language, which is catechism, which is essentially formal instruction in Christian doctrine. It's formal instruction in Christian, in Christian doctrine. Not just a little bit here, a little bit there, but it's like uh, a course or a whole instruction from beginning to from beginning to end, that one is, is going to be giving some time and attention to. So it is going to be a catechism that I hope to put together for your benefit and spiritual growth and for anybody else who wants to read that. 
in also in this in this whole lingo, the person who does this has often been called the catechist, and uh, the people who are taught have been traditionally called the catechumens. <laughs> and uh, for some of you maybe have known a bit of church history, you know that people who were catechumens were 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 sort of people who were seeking to be baptized, especially in early Christianity. St. Augustine was a famous one who for years was a catechumen. He was a candidate for, for reception into the church, but he had to go through a whole course of Christian doctrine and Christian instruction. And uh, this word in the time of the Reformation became very, very popular again as, uh, as the Protestants were educating their followers in the, in the truths of the faith. And it comes from a Greek word, katecheo, which is, means to teach or instruct in the Bible. For example, in Galatians 6.6, 6, it says, let the one who instructs, well, let the one who is instructed share all good things with the one who instructs. So, I have to produce sort of a bit of a catechism for you and for myself too, and for anybody who's interested. But really, my ambition also is by the mercy of the Lord. And that's important. Because and this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. Paul says, by the mercy of the Lord, what I say is trustworthy. It's only by the mercy of the Lord that we can understand God and theology and His truths well. It's not in ourselves. We are contaminated and pride and distortions inevitably happen. And there, there are often other reasons and motives going on inside of us. But Paul says, and I want to say as well, that by the mercy of the Lord throughout this course, I want us with you to answer this question about the question that what ought Christians to believe about the important subjects of our day and of the Bible? What ought Christians to believe about the scriptures and about all the topics that we are facing? What ought we to believe? And that's a very important question what we ought to believe. So by the mercy of the Lord, we will know what, or come closer to know what we ought to believe by looking at the Scriptures and putting it all together. Now, I, I, I have a dedication which I didn't expect to do, but I'm, I'm probably just going to share it with you. And I, I, I first wrote this about seven, eight years ago when I was lecturing and I was still at Strand Baptist Church. And we, um, we had a Bible study in our home. <coughs> and uh, only Heather would remember this. And we were going through 2 Corinthians. This was actually many years ago we were going through 2 Corinthians. And there in, sorry, 1 Corinthians. And there in 1 Corinthians 4 9, Paul's encouraging the, the church to love one another. And he says, I don't actually need to tell you to love one another. Because you are already taught by God to love one another. And Paul uses a very interesting word. Uh, I'll give it to you in the Greek. Theodidactoi. That's what Paul says. And it's a compound word which theos comes from theos, which is God, and didactic. God taught, and that's a plural, people. It's all one word in Greek. You see, it's three in English. God taught people. You are theodidactoi. Paul writes to the people. And uh, this is a very important word because the New Covenant teaching is that God Himself will teach us these things. Yes, we have teachers, but ultimately Christians are people who are taught by God. And as second one John also speaks about the anointing that will will teach us all things. Now one person who was in there was Pitt Stain Jr. And he was a real boor. <laughs> he said to me, yeah, he said to me, because he, he came to our, in winter, he came to the Bible studies, and it was freezing, and he comes in a t-shirt, and he comes in shorts, he's, you know, and uh, I said, don't you get cold? He says, yeah, uh, then I put on two shorts. <laughs> but I was very surprised. Now, 
he did no sort of formal theological training, but when it came to this, he, something registered with him. I told him the Greek word, and from then on, he got it, that we are people who are taught by God. So I... So, when I was thinking of writing a systematic theology, I, I, I dedicated it to him. And I, I, it's very emotional because he was murdered in Bonnyvale, quite gruesomely, with his wife. And now if I look at that word, I think of him. Mm. All right, so we will, we will see him and celebrate sooner than we will expect with one another the good things of God. So, let's begin our introduction to Christian theology. And please, uh, if you could turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, verses 9. Now, while you're turning up there, let me say that in the course that we're going to go through, it's not just going to be Bible study all the time. What we're going to be doing is try to put the Bible together, put the pieces together, as we will explain. But I do want to uh, look at certain important scriptures as we go through this course. Now, one of the scriptures which I think is very important to understanding the role of Christian teaching is Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 to 14. This is what Paul says. He says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy and giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. There's few scriptures in the Bible that hang so much about knowing God's counsel and knowing God's will as the scripture. And I want you to see that. Paul is praying for this church and he prays, what he's praying for in this verse is that you might come to know, to be not just to know, but be, to be filled with this knowledge of God's will and God's purpose in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And this, the way Paul uses the term God's will here in Colossians, is not God's will, His ethical will, what we should do, how we should live. It's the whole will of God for this world. His whole purpose for creation, for this universe. Everything that was in the mind and the counsel of God from the beginning of time that He began to reveal with creation and Israel and then the coming of Jesus Christ and the redemption of Christ. And the whole purpose of God is called the will of God here. The, the, the mind of God, the purpose of God, as he calls this later on in the book of Acts as well. And so he wants the church to know this will. And isn't it an amazing thing that you and I are part of this will of God? The reason why we, we exist here, why we as human beings and as Christians exist, is because of this great purpose and counsel of God in this universe. This is His design, His plan. He's the architect of everything. And Paul here prays for this church that they might be, not just know a little bit, but they might be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And why does he pray that? He prays that so that all these other things from verse 10 downward would be able to take place. Do you see that? Be filled with the knowledge of the will so that you might walk worthy of the Lord, you might be fully pleasing to Him, you might be bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with power for all endurance, giving thanks to the Father who's qualified us. 
all of those uh, lifestyle or Christian godly behaviors or living a life pleasing to God in this scripture, it all flows from knowing God's will. If you can see the connection, it's quite something. So how can you live a life worthy of God? How can you be filled with, with His power, continue in patience? In this scripture, Paul says, it, go, it goes back to be filled with the knowledge of His will. It's true. If you know God, your Father, and you know His providence and power and purpose and wonderful plan for the life of the believer, and how He's bringing His people into glory. If you, the more you know about God's will for His children or God's purpose for His children through all the ups and downs of life, the more you'll be able to give thanks because you're aware of something. So I'm not going to go into that scripture in a lot of detail, but uh, that will be, I think, a theme verse throughout this whole course, filled with the knowledge of His will. So that we might live a life worthy of God. And what does that life worthy of God look like? Giving thanks, being strengthened. But it all is hooked on the knowledge of His will. Everything else hangs upon that. What an important exhortation for that. Now, let's first talk about some introductory issues before we leap into the whole world of Christian doctrine and Christian teaching, we're going to spend some time now looking before we leap. That's not a bad thing. It has been called prolegomena in, in the theological circles. And by the way, I'm going to give you some technical words for what they're worth. If it's in one ear, out one, or the other ear, that's no problem. It's fine, because sometimes we don't have to know all these big words. But uh, just, I'm just telling you that because it, we are dealing with the discipline of theology, and there's, there are going to be some issues. But prolegomena, if you study theology, is the introductory matters that we need to deal with, the preliminaries, before we start to look at the content of our faith. We need to give some time about that. And we need to clear the plot before you start to build. I mean, that's wisdom, isn't it? Before you start, just go ahead and just go ahead and build and start. And you say, no, hang on a sec here. Let's clear the ground. Let's level it. Let's get everything nice and order because we're going to put up something that is important here and we need to make sure we have good foundations in place. Uh, and this is a very important issue. Uh, before we look at all the content, is to look at getting prepared and getting positioned to be able to think correctly, wisely, clearly about these things. And uh, to understand all these, all these matters. It's a little bit like these introductory issues, a bit like a porch before you go into the house. Now, we don't want the porch to be too big either, to spend all our time there with these preliminary issues. You want to get into the house. Uh, but you also need a porch. You just don't go straight from the street into the... You need to just have a bit of a porch area. Sometimes people spend too much time. Other times they spend too little time. But we need to spend some time just getting our bearings and looking at some definitions and the character of what Christian theology is going to be. And some of these introductory issues, we're going to look at uh, why study Christian doctrine, the fact and function of Christian doctrine in the New Testament. Uh, we're going to look at a bit of some definitions. What do we mean by theology or doctrine? Are they the same thing? Or beliefs? We're going to look at some characters of Christian theology. And then we're going to look at some different dispensations of theology, which is an interesting topic you probably won't find elsewhere. In other words, how the Old Testament knew God is a bit different to how we know God because of the progressive revelation. We'll look at such a thing as heresy and orthodoxy. What's heresy? We need to know what heresy is. False teaching. What are dangers in studying theology? Are there some dangers? Well, there are. 
Paul mentions some dangers about pride, etc. And then we look at, well, how, do we, how, how can we study theology and get into that? So there are some of these preliminary issues for this week and next week. Uh, if it doesn't get you, that's fine. You can come when we sort of start the doctrine of God and, and about the being and existence and purpose of God. But I think these things are important because you know when you uh, go to listen to an orchestra play, a famous orchestra, if you get there a bit early, you'll hear in where the orchestra sits just a whole lot of clatter and noise and discord and cacophony coming out of the orchestra pit. And you say, this is ridiculous. I haven't come here to listen to this. No, but they're just warming up. The orchestra sounds terrible when they're warming up. But just give them time. They're doing that for a purpose. And then they're going to be, wow, they're going to be giving you something worthwhile coming for. So uh, bear with me in some of these things. Might be a bit discordant, you know, well, but uh, it's, it's, these are some important things and uh, we need to spend a little bit of time looking at them. So let's first launch into uh, why study Christian doctrine. And I'm going to just read some things here. I'm not going to give you a lot of time with this, but I'll, I'll, this will all be available for you and uh, there'll be some things that you can uh, think about here. But it's important whenever you're looking at a subject, why is this subject important? So what? what? Aren't there better things that we can be doing with ourselves? Why is this important? And well, I might be, as they call, preaching to the choir or speaking to the converted here because you've given up on a, on a Saturday afternoon to come here, so you can, do consider that this is important. But uh, I'll give you some points, but before I do that, let me be a little bit poetic and say something like this. As we need a reliable map for the landscape, and as we need the composer's score to play the song well, as we need plans for the building, as you need a recipe for your dish, as the skeleton, as the body needs a skeleton, and as a creeper needs a terrace, and as the fire needs coals to burn on, so we need Christian doctrine. Let me run through some reasons why this is important that we study this. And of course the primary thing is to know our God better, and to love Him and to serve Him better. This is the ultimate objective of why we should want to study theology. Because Christian theology is talking about how God has revealed Himself and made Himself known and communicated certain information and important things about Him. And in that light of God's own self-revelation, we can love Him, see Him more clearly and serve Him better. So it's to know Him and love Him better. Just as in any relationship, the more you reveal you people in a good relationship, know about one another, the more they can appreciate one another. So it's ultimately to know God more. You know, we, we live in a lovely area here, in, the, in this whole area. But it's so easy to take where we live for granted, isn't it? Get to know your area here. Go for a walk in a new place. Go up the mountains. Spend some time just walking in the fainbos. Slow down and just open up your eyes and take in the surroundings. Get to know this area where we live better. And the more you get to know it better, the more you will appreciate it, won't you? The more you'll be so glad of living here, and the more you will love it. And it's like that for so many things. It's when it's taken away that we then realize the value that it is. And in learning these things about God, it's to expose ourselves to how wonderful and how glorious, how good He is, and all that He's revealed about Himself in His majesty. And the more we just think about it and are exposed to it, the more we can thank Him and love Him and appreciate Him. And this is ultimately, and glorify Him, one of the main reasons for that. Secondly, 
this course is important to heal our minds. To heal our minds. We have all been corrupted by sin in our thinking. This is a clear fact. All our, all our conceptions, particularly about God, are corrupted to certain degrees. All of us to a certain degree. And in learning about the revelation of God, in learning good theology, we lessen that degree of corruption and distortion in looking up the glory of God and the things of God. And we start to have a better image of who He is. We all know whether it's our upbringing, our experience, just as life happens to us, that affects the way we perceive and the way we think of God. I'll say this throughout this course, we all have caricatures. And caricatures are like those mirrors at the carnival. I mean, that's, I've never been to a carnival and done that. When you go to the hall of mirrors and there are all the caricatures that you see, just your massive stomach in one and other one will just see your head or something like that or make you look thin or just your feet will be massive in one mirror. It's a caricature. You've got the yeah, out, you can see that sort of you, but hey, that's like weird uh, the way it's coming across. Now we've got those mirrors, you and me have got those mirrors in our minds. And they're all distorted. And learning Christian doctrine and theology is to focus in more about into the truth, into the revelation of God. So that we can see Him and know ourselves and see the world more clearly. And to lessen that degree that we have been affected by. Thirdly, Christian doctrine is important to arbitrate between truth and between falsehood. Between truth and between falsehood. I think this is fairly self-explanatory today, isn't it? How do you know if something is wrong? This preacher says that. Another preacher says that. About the second coming of the Lord. Or about the gifts of the Spirit. Or about sanctification. He says that. You both respect these people. How can you then know who's true? How you need, you, you need to arbitrate. You need to evaluate. And how can you do that? Or are you just left up to the opinions of people? This is why Christian theology is there. And why Christian doctrine is there. Is to bring the truth into sharper focus in your life. So that you will be able to be discerning for what's happening. It's a little bit like, and I don't want to... Uh, I'm not going to get into this, but it's a bit like Bible translations. You have uh, an NIV or you have the ESV and you compare this or living. You, and you have these Bible, they all say something different. How do you know which Bible translation is true? Uh, you, how can you arbitrate? How can you have sort of something in your mind to compare it with? A standard, a gold standard. And it's Greek and Hebrew. So, unless you know the original language, just like anything, is this a good Afrikaans translation? Or You have to compare it to something else to be able to evaluate. Uh, there has to be the pivot on the scale you know, of justice. How, do you, how can you evaluate? Uh, and it's like that in theology. And this is why we do that, to bring the truth into sharper focus so that we can discern. It's a very important thing today, to be able to discern. Fourthly, is to, is to give us, and it's related to this, first-hand knowledge and assurance of the truth of God. First-hand knowledge. Very much related to exactly what I have said. The Lord said, if you listen to my word... You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, there's something about you, not your husband, your wife, your pastor, but yourself. Building up what you become certain and are sure about, about these great truths. Yes, Jesus is returning. Or yes, I know that on the cross He did something that, that I believe is true. And 
you know for yourself, not just what other people taught you. And this is a big part of Christian growth and maybe a part of life. We first, we first sort of, when we come to the Lord and come into faith, the authorities that we have in our life, tend, they're the ones that we learn to trust them because we don't know any better. But as we grow as a Christian, you will start to even uh, say, well, no, but you know, my pastor says this, how can I be certain that's true? You, you need to know the truth for yourself. And this is, what, this is what Christian doctrine is trying to do. A very important next one is to give you skill in making sense of Scripture. How oh, this is such an important one. To give you skill in making sense of Scripture. Now we've had this issue uh, in our little small group, and I think maybe some of you have as well. In the last while we were looking at the miracles of Jesus. And when it comes to the miraculous ministry of Jesus and all that's going on there, if you do a study, you, you can find out Christians believe quite a lot of different things about that. And they will refer to different scriptures. Some will be referring to the, the miracle that Jesus is doing is very much not in His own deity, but by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And another scripture, maybe from the Gospel of John, will very much look at this miracle as a sign of His deity, and He's doing it in His own authority. as who He is. Scripture is very diverse. This is the source of why we have different denominations. This is the source of why, they're, why Christians, good Christians, disagree with one another. It's because the Bible has a rich diversity. And trying to put this together is what Christian doctrine is, is trying to do for you. It's not all about just quoting a verse. It's understanding the verses and building with them together. An illustration I'll often use, and it's a good one, is the jigsaw puzzle illustration. You see, the Bible's a whole lot of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and uh, we're trying to put the jigsaw puzzle together to make sense of the whole of Scripture. This is what doctrine and theology is doing. Some people put it together in a different way. And uh, sometimes the pieces, you know when you do, you do jigsaw puzzles, they don't seem to fit, but you're going to make it fit. <laughs> so, so that piece is going to do. And a lot of the times with putting the Bible together, sometimes we just need to put a piece or a verse to the side and say, I don't know how this will fit in, but given time, I'm sure I will find out how it works. We all start with the, with the border, because that's nice and easy, and there are certain fundamentals we start with. But Scripture is like that. It's very, very diverse. And so this course is designed to give us, not perfectly, but to propose a cover picture for you to work with. That's what you do with the jigsaw pieces. You, 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 you. Okay, this is a, probably what it's going to be like. And it's to give you a bit of a, a picture of how we can make sense of all these different things. I'll just mention two more of course, this, on the previous one, the Bible says we must handle accurately the word of truth. That's what Paul said to Timothy. Timothy, it's worthwhile I read this. Make every effort to present yourself to God as one who is approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, correctly handling the word of God. Correctly handling those pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And make every effort to do that. And I'm not ashamed of the length of the course and some of the technical things because we need to be mature in our thinking. We need to think hard. It's a deep subject and it's quite complex. We can't be superficial in studying theology and think it's going to be easy. If you do, uh, you underestimate the gravity and glory of the subject of God and of His glory. He's great and we are always out of our depth. But it, it requires our best thinking for our whole lives uh, in coming to understand the big picture. Just the last two is to fulfill our calling to be a prophetic people to witness to the truth. Christians are to be a prophetic people speaking truth into our world. And if we don't do it, who else is going to do it? 
We have to speak the truth. And this is one thing, I'm, I'm, and I, I use it intentionally, a prophetic people anointed with the spirit of truth to, we have been, the truth has been revealed, we know it, we grasp it, we hold forth the word of life, we know the truth and we speak the truth. And doing this course is important for our witness in our world today uh, in reaching out to people, but particularly standing for the truth. And lastly, the last one, is to leave cans for future generations. To leave something for, for the future generation. To pass on something. And this is what we've all got to do. Scriptures say you need to pass something on. Men you know, teach others. Elderly women teach the younger woman the faith, etc. There's, a, there's passing on, handing on the baton from one generation to the next. And it's to leave something. And uh, um, for the sake of our American brother, do you know what a can is? I'm not... No, a can, C-A-I-R-N. Now when we go walking out here, maybe we'll go walking on Monday, um, particularly after there's been a very bad felt fight, and all the normal sort of pathways through, through out in the felt have disappeared, and you don't know, you feel where should you go now? Which way should you go? The traditional landmarks are no longer here. A fire has spread through. How do you know where to go? Look for a can. And some good hiker who's thought about the other people and the future generations would have piled those stones together on a prominent rock. A little pile like this, like a pyramid shape on top of one another. It's a sign of a human construction. Oh, that's, unless you're an evolutionist, even cans are four by the way. <laughs> but normally, it's our humans that do that. Uh, oh, there's somebody who's left a can there. That's where we're going. Thank God for those cans. When the traditional things have fallen by the wayside, what do you look for? You look for a can. And we have to be leaving that uh, and to provide guidance for people when we are long gone. And... Uh, uh, and speaking the truth and passing thing, these things down. So, it's, it's, this is why we, we are to give time and attention to these things. And there probably is a lot more reasons, even for our own sense of purpose. How do you know the significance of your life? It's uh, what you must do. God's Word and good theology will provide reasons for that. Let's go on to the second thing, and uh, I also want to refer to a scripture. Now what I did, and I mentioned this in the video that I did, it's always been a habit of mine when I'm teaching on a topic to try and read through the whole Bible on that topic. Uh, I said to Neil, just chatting a bit about this, for example, on the Holy Spirit, when I had to teach on the Holy Spirit, Take a, a concordance or something and just say, wherever that word is mentioned, let me look at it. Uh, that's a very important principle to st study the Bible yourself. And, oh, by the way, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, as I said to Neil too, did you know the book of Jeremiah, there's not one mention of the word the Holy Spirit in Jeremiah. Well, wow, that's strange. Uh, uh, and Isaiah has a lot. So you pick up things like that. So what I did in preparing to teach on Christian theology, so say, well, what does the New Testament say about that? Because that is important. I don't want this to be something that is like just imposed upon you because it's my idea or uh, in any other body's idea. It mustn't be an imposition that you study doctrine and theology by somebody else. It must be because Scripture itself says you should do this. It's an expository idea. And when we use the word exposition, we, we mean we're taking a truth from out of the Bible and we're applying that. We're not taking something else and imposing it on the Bible or ourselves. So I want, this, I want us to be interested in this and sign up slowly for the next few months and years in studying Christian doctrine, not because it's just a great idea to do, but because God's Word actually has a very high view of Christian doctrine and how it presents it. And I was amazed when I looked at all the different references. So, so I'm going to say a few words on that. Some of my gleanings from 
spending Thursday last week in the public holiday or so in just sitting with the Bible and reading through this. Uh, let's turn one of the most important verses in looking at the New Testament's own assessment of Christian doctrine is Romans chapter 6 verse 17. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. Paul's writing, remember, to a church that he's never met. He doesn't know them. And uh, Romans 6, 17 says this. But thanks be to God that though you were once slaves of sin, you have become obedient from the heart to that standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. Now this little word, you have become obedient from the heart to that standard or form of teaching. It's not just the teaching. You become obedient from the heart to that standard of teaching is a very, very important thing to what we, what we are going to be looking at. Because the Christian faith and the Christian belief has a distinct doctrinal and confessional identity and context and shape and form. It's a particular type of teaching that God used to save you. It's not just any teaching, any word or anything. It's a particular type of teaching that Paul said was used by God. Now this is broadly, uh, except true, as well for any religions. If you want to know, alright, there's teaching in Judaism, there's teaching in Islam, there's teaching in uh, many of the other faiths. They have a particular shape to their teaching, a particular form. The angles and the, the content of that is something that is distinct. And this is what Paul says saved you and what you were committed to. It was a particular form of teaching. There was a, an, an old Puritan writer, and I'm going to use his word throughout this course. He was a Puritan writer in the 1600s called Thomas Watson. And Thomas Watson has a book which is a good book to read. I've got it but never really read much of it. I mean, but uh, from when I have dipped in it's been very good. And his book is called A Body of Divinity. A Body of Divinity. And he was pretty much saying the same thing. That there's a particular shape and body to Christian truth. It is eyes and legs. It is a particular shape. Just as much as human beings have a particular form, uh, other animals have, you know, or creatures have their own form and their own shape. There's a distinctiveness. And it's this shape of teaching that uh, is, is what the New Testament is communicating and wanting to school us in. And everything that we're going to be talking about, thinking about, considering about, discussing is going to be about the type of teaching. What the New Testament teaching is. This type of teaching that is distinct, that is distinguishable, that has a shape. We need to make sure that we are in line with that. And so this is, even in the New Testament, giving us uh, um, highlighting the importance of this matter. If you know your Old Testament, remember there was Ahiliel van Bezalel, the great artisans who constructed the tabernacle of Moses. And they went to work in constructing the tabernacle of Moses. But they didn't just go about doing their own thing, remember. They, they had an image that they were building on. Moses wrote down what he received from God and they were constructing the tabernacle based on a certain form and shape of teaching that they had been given. And it's likewise for us. The New Testament is a body, has a body of divinity with this distinctiveness. And it's going to be the focus of what we are going to be looking about 
and uh, uh, we, we, we're not a will to create our own theology. How much, that's important today. And people say, well, what they like, they just believe this or they feel that. Well, that's, well, well no, that might, that's fine for you, but this is not what Christianity is. Christianity has a form of teaching. And we must make sure that we align ourselves with that form of teaching that is there. So there is this form of teaching that Paul says here. And isn't it amazing in this verse that it says that thanks be to God, it was through this form of teaching that He brought you to salvation, that He opened up your heart. It was the form of teaching, a particular message that did the work. And this form of teaching in these verses shows that how the whole human being is involved here. This verse talks about the mind, which is what your is the teaching, the teaching that you heard, but it speaks about the heart, verse 17, you were coming obedient from the heart, and it speaks about the will, about your obedience. You're obedient from the heart. It's a lovely word, isn't it? A lovely idea. To be obedient from the... Oh, I just want to be obedient. <laughs> That's the type of obedience that this form of teaching does. It reveals the glory of God. They say, what? It's this lovely thing to serve this God and to obey Him. That's what the form of teaching is. But when the form of teaching is a caricature or distorted with those mirrors, then we, you know, it's, it's going to affect us. Um... The other scripture, which is one of the other important ones, is Jude chapter 3. Let's have a look at Jude 3. This was Jesus' brother who wrote this. And uh, the book should be called Judas. Isn't it like that in the Afrikaans translation? I don't know. Yeah. It's Judas. Far better. But you see, it's rather... We, we don't to turn, turn to the book of Judas. Oh, that sounds rather shocking. But just a common name. Jesus' brother. And he says in verse 3 here, Beloved, reading from the ESV, Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Very important scripture for this whole course. It says, I want you to fight for and contend and take a firm stand for the faith that was given. There's a, there's a body of teaching. There's a, a hard core of doctrine that has backbone and spine. It has an essence. We can't make it up or create it. It's there in the New Testament. It's a faith that was given in the New Testament and it's given once and for all of Christians throughout Christian history. And you must fight to maintain that and to live it out. And to, this is everything that we're going to be doing. The faith that was given once for all to all the saints. <coughs> now, keep this scripture in mind. There are a whole lot of different words. I will often, sometimes we would, there's another nice Greek word, didaskalia. You can see that's related to that. This is, we would call teaching, the teaching, the didaskalia, the teaching. Where we get the word didactic from. Didascalia, as the New, New Testament speaks, it talks about this body of divinity, the faith that was delivered, the teaching, continue in the teaching, abide in the teaching. Now, the Old Testament uses, I would say, any of you want to take a guess, what would an Old Testament word be for this truth in the New Testament? How, how or not that it's the New Testament, but a word for the teaching in the Old Testament? Law. Yeah, and Torah. it's Hebrew word? Torah. Torah. Which is instruction. Instruction. 
The word law is very legal, legal and it's not always in legal context, especially in Proverbs, father to son. Hold to my Torah, hold to my instruction. But this is a, a huge word in the Old Testament. And it's instruction. It's didaskalia. It's a signpost of, of a way you should live. Yeah, but it's, it's fixed. You can't change it. God has given the Torah and He showed us what the teaching is. Our job is now to just get in line with that and to follow through with this. Um, I, what I have done, and I'm going to read this, just sit and listen to this. This I have summarized here from, um, from Acts to Revelation. What function this doctrine in the New Testament, in all these verses... What is the function of this didaskalia and this, this teaching? Let me quickly, I'm not going to give you the verses, you can have a look at this. It saves our souls. It is the agency of regeneration. It keeps us in fellowship with God, the didaskalia, the teaching. It brings us into the presence of God. It gives us victory. It keeps us clean. It sanctifies our lives. It brings growth in grace. It brings fruitfulness. It gives us true riches. It is the agent for church maturity. It is the agent for ongoing renewal. It is joy and life. It is a belt, Ephesians, of course, a belt of truth to support us. It's a path for our feet. It reveals Christ. It enables us to stand firm. It informs us of error. It shows us who is right. It enables us to resist evil. It keeps us from deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons. It keeps us from being puffed up and conceited and stupid. It helps identify false prophecy. It is God speaking to us. It brings us the knowledge of the truth. It nurtures sincere faith and a pure heart and a good conscience. It enables us to teach and admonish others. It keeps us from ignorance and keeps us in continuity with the apostles and brings us into our inheritance. These are things that the teaching does. What better reason, if this happens, should we be getting into it? Then I looked at, that's what the scriptures say about the doctrine and the teaching and the theology that has been given by the apostles and Christ. And the function it is, it does those things. Then I asked the question, what sort of relationship should we have to the teaching of the Bible in these verses? How should we position ourselves towards the teaching of the Bible? And this is what Acts to Revelation says in summary. And the first I'm going to quote from Jude 3. What are we to do? To exert intense effort on behalf of the faith. This is what Jude says here. Exert intense effort. To listen to it. To be taught by it. To believe it. To receive it with humility into our lives. To love it. To obey it. To know it. To keep it. To abide in it. To walk in it. To stand firm in it. To not stray from it to pay close attention to it, to hold it fast, to be clothed in it, to handle it skillfully, to beautify it with good conduct, says Titus, to not be ashamed of it, to preach it, to speak it with boldness, to remember it, to guard it, to pass it on to faithful men, to be worthy of it, to attain to it, and to let itself let it be itself in us. Those are some of the things that is revealed about this doctrine and truth. So these are the reasons why we need to learn good theology. It is vital for every aspect of our life. I want to now say something here in looking at the New Testament, uh, a little bit about this word faith in the New Testament. So, 
Because when Jude says here, I want you to contend for the faith, the faith, or earnestly fight for the faith, would you just say on a little bit of an aside, this 